Welcome. This is Gary Salton, Chief of R&D and Creator of IOP Technology. This video both expands and abbreviates a research blog available on IOP.com. The subject of both the blog and this video is how professors process information and the implications of their choice, which are substantial. If you would rather read than listen, you can access the blog directly from our homepage. Now, professors come in various flavors from full to adjunct. A meaningful sample must capture this full range. Our sample of 254 professors are spread across all of the professorial ranks. The sample is reasonably representative of the academic community within which professors function. Professors also teach a plethora of subjects. The subject being taught can reflect itself in the information processing strategy used. Math and English professors will tend to rely on very different approaches. Our sample includes a wide variety of the subjects taught. It appears reasonably representative of the university as a whole. Finally, universities differ in endowment, location, specialization, student body composition, and on and on. These factors can reflect themselves in the kinds of professors attracted and retained. Our study uses a large number and wide variety of institutions to capture this diversity. Overall, the data on which this study is based appears solid. So, what does our representative data tell us? Well, here is the average strength of the IOP style, a measure of information processing for each professorial rank. The similarity in their approach jumps off the page. The average professor relies on the idea-oriented relational innovator, or RI style, as their principal method of navigating life. They use the analytical hypothetical analyzer, or HA style, as their secondary stance. Both of these strategies, the analytical HA and the idea generating RI, are thought based. Both can be executed without doing anything that directly affects anyone else. But what about that big gap in the HA style strength? Does that mean that there are two kinds of professors? The embedded table shows that there is only a 5% chance that this gap is a random variation. Academically, that 5% means that the gap is marginally significant. It may be a true difference, but you should be careful before putting too much faith in it. When dealing with marginally significant results, you look for confirmation. Here is a blow-up of the matrix of significance tests for all of the relationships in the professor data. The 23 other statistical tests are insignificant. It looks like the 5% result is just an anomaly. It is reasonable to judge that professors tend to use roughly the same IOP strategies in the conduct of their teaching, research, and life. That means we can treat all 254 professors as a group, you know, a single unit. But does this commonality and approach have any practical significance? The simple answer is yes. It means that professors tend to look at the world in the same way. You know, focus on the same kind of variables, weigh them in similar fashion, and arrive at the same kind or character of conclusion. This is likely to create a common theme on any given subject. That common theme invites stereotypes. You know, oversimplified generalizations. Sayings like, those that can't do, teach. So. Stereotypes like absent-minded professor just describe the natural outcome of the information processing strategy used. Since professors tend to use similar strategies, the stereotype will contain that often cited grain of truth. Let's dig a little deeper and see if we can discover some stuff of more significance. The place to start digging is the dominant idea-oriented RI style. The way to start digging is to look at how strongly that RI style is being held. And the result is a bit strange. The profile has a double peak. In IOP studies of different professions, industries, and areas, strength distributions tend to follow relatively smooth curves. So, what makes this different? Well, 
Maybe it is the different subjects being taught. Let's find out by splitting our professors into the traditional hard and soft sciences. It turns out that categorizing a subject as hard or soft is something of a judgment call. Subjects do not divide up as cleanly as the terms hard and soft might suggest. You can read the research blog for detail on exactly how the subjects were divided. But for now, we've got two groups of about equal size to work with. Now if the double relational innovator peak is the result of the subject, we would expect to see the peak for hard science professors in one place and the peak for soft science professors in another. Then, when we merge the hard and soft science professors, we would get the dual peak. But that is not what is happening. Both the hard and soft sciences have a dual peak. The merging process is not the cause. The dual peak is there even if the hard and soft sciences are considered separately. That means the cause must be something common to all subjects and all areas of the university. Let's take a deeper look. Here we split the RI strength distribution by professorial rank. The double peak seems to appear at all levels, except one. That one is the adjunct professor. Now we have a clue on where to look for the source of our double peak. There is something that is common to all of the professorial ranks except adjunct. And that something is probably tenure. All professorial ranks except adjunct can be tenure track positions. Tenure is typically seen as an individual shield. You know, it keeps you from getting fired for having the wrong ideas. But that cannot account for the double peak. All tenured staff get the same protection. There must be something else going on. And that something is probably the dual grounds on which tenure is typically granted. A portion of professors earn tenure simply by the volume and importance of their ideas. But there is another route. Tenure can be obtained by publishing analyses, teaching, representing the university in various forms, handling administration, and otherwise supporting necessary university functions. These dual access routes neatly explain the double peak. The two routes act to create two kinds of professors. Tenure criteria also explain the absence of the double peak among adjunct professors. Adjuncts are essentially contractors. Tenure criteria are simply not applicable. Hence, no double peak. So, what are the effects of having the university populated by two kinds of professors? The most important one is that both kinds of professors appear to be critical for the creation of reliable knowledge. In other words, knowledge you can trust. This happens through papers, lectures, panels, and a host of less formal venues. These settings are used to test and confirm new theories, proposals, and ideas. Academics residing on the higher peak have more ideas. Thus, they are more likely to offer the ideas that become the subject of academic interest. Those on the lower peak are likely to offer fewer new ideas, but they bring something else to the party. That something is a stronger analytical HA and methodical LP capability. In this graphic, those capabilities are superimposed on the RI double peak. For clarity, the HA and LP columns are shown only for the two peak RI levels. The scale for the RI line is on the left and refers to the percentage of the sampled professors holding a particular RI strength. The scale on the right refers to the average strength of the LP and HA styles held by the people occupying positions on the two RI peaks. The difference in professors on the two peaks is obvious. The higher the idea-oriented RI, the lower the inclination toward the more rigorous HA and LP styles. Now, reliable knowledge is built on an adversarial process. People on the high RI peak are more likely to be the ones proposing new knowledge. People on the lower peak have more capacity for analysis and discipline processes. They are more likely to be the ones testing the new ideas and theories. These two forces, both created by the tenure process, 
are what play out in the various forums where ideas, theories, and proposals are subject to evaluation. Strong advocates for both positions ensure that any accepted knowledge is solid. The case for the knowledge effects of tenure is strong, but it is not conclusive. A truly solid case would involve tracking the actual contributions of the two kinds of professors. That is beyond the reach of our data. But what has been discovered is enough to throw up a strong warning. Tampering with the university's tenure system may have serious unintended consequences. These effects are likely to extend far beyond those experienced by the individual professor. They may directly reduce the production of reliable knowledge by our universities. The stakes in any discussion limiting tenure are high. They literally may involve the degree of knowledge available to a society. It is worth noting that there is a price being paid for the dual peak, and it is being paid by the students. This is the RI style distribution of 1,800 graduate and undergraduate students from 31 different colleges and universities. And this is the RI distribution of the professors who are teaching them. The average student must convert what the professor is saying into a form that they can incorporate into their own framework of understanding. This is a penalty that compromises learning. The fit of the student-professor profiles on the RI dimension is about 33% as measured by R square or the coefficient of determination. This is by far the most discrepant among the four principal IOPT information processing styles. In other words, the strategic style posture most responsible for fulfilling the university's mission of expanding knowledge is the same one that can compromise its mission of intergenerational knowledge transfer. Kind of a sweet irony, isn't it? Now lesson plans, textbooks, and supplemental materials that force knowledge into a particular framework can mitigate the damage but the discrepancy is still visible in classroom and other discussions that form the core of the university experience. This learning hurdle can be reduced through a very simple process. Professors high on the RI scale can be taught how to adopt their students' learning posture. There is no need for the professors to change. They simply acquire a new skill. They then just apply the student's preferred processing style or the time that they are interacting with those students. After that, they can revert to their preferred strategy. Teaching the adjustment process is the easy part. Convincing accomplished professors that they do not already have access to the holy grail of teaching may be the insurmountable challenge. Let's wrap this up with a quick summary. We're pretty sure that we are working with a representative sample of professors. We've determined that professors share a common information processing strategy and that this generates commonality in behavior, which puts the grain of truth in the professor stereotypes. We went on to discover an almost universal double peak in the professor's RI strength distribution. We traced the cause of the double peak, not to tenure itself, but to the two bases on which tenure is granted. This process created two kinds of professors. Their interplay is what is responsible for the creation of reliable knowledge, a major university objective. This insight caused us to raise a warning against tampering with the tenure process. Unintended consequences can be very serious for society as a whole. We also found that there was a price being paid. The intergenerational transfer of knowledge is compromised by the disjoint between the professor and student's RI profile. Overall, important knowledge has been gained from this study of 254 professors. In final analysis, there is no substitute for evidence-based research guided by a firm and validated theory. Thank you for viewing this video. If you would like to learn more about IOP technology, please visit our websites at iop.com or oeinstitute.org. 
Both sites have much more information on IOPTA in the areas where it has or can be applied. Thank you again for your interest in IOP technology.